Hey, this is Tony from the XJ Talk Show telling you about episode 148 coming up this week. It'll be released on Monday. Don't forget to join us on our live shows every Thursday, 10 p.m. Central. Episode 149 will be next week. Come join us for the live show. Just go over to uh, xjtalkshow.com. You'll be able to see the video and chat in our little chat room. Uh, I've got some great stuff this week. we got two Jeep tips. Uh, that's largely due to Josh not being here, so <laughs> come join us. The XJ Talk Show is for entertainment purposes only. Any advice or information provided on this show should be verified by alternative sources prior to making any changes or modifications to your vehicle. We are not experts, just people that enjoy the Jeep hobby and don't mind talking endlessly about it. P.S. We love you. XJ Talk Show is on the air. Okay, it's a podcast. Oh, you know what I mean. Anyway, here's Tony and Josh. Hey, well, it's me tonight, not Josh. Unfortunately, Josh had a little accident in the family. Uh, you thought I was going for a joke there, I'm sure, but this is serious business. Uh, I don't think Josh would mind me saying his father-in-law was involved in a motorcycle accident tonight, and he had to go to the hospital. So if everybody would uh, take a few moments and uh, say a, a nice uh, few words in, in prayer for Josh's father-in-law, I know we would all appreciate it, and uh, I'm sure it'd make a, a huge difference uh, in uh, the recovery of uh, of him. We'll we'll be getting more on that later. And uh, as I said in the pre-show, I, if I know Josh, he if at all possible, he'll probably show up uh, while the show is going on, which means we get to reconfigure the camera here. So anyway, let's get going and see how badly I can mess this up. First week in G. So uh, this was also prepared by Josh, the consummate, or, or is it constipated? No, consummate professional that he is. Uh, he uh, got all this uh, these notes set up, so all I have to do is read. Hey, this week in Jeep, details on the 2015 Jeep Grand Cherokee Trailhawk has been released. Four features stand out about the Jeep Grand Cherokee Trail uh, Trailhawk 2 concept. The Jeep comes, <clears throat> uh, sorry, the Jeep comes with an amazing 3.0 v6 turbo diesel that makes the four makes 420 foot pounds of torque hooked up to a eight speed automatic transmission hmm, no nine speed uh, mopar tow hooks rock rails skid plates and beefy 35 inch mickey thompson mtz mounted to mopar wrangler wheels complete most of the package that's right i said 35 inch mud geranes Jeep cut larger wheel openings and lifted the Jeep Grand uh, Cherokee Trailhawk 2 to squeeze the rubber underneath. <laughs> We've all been there, guys. And I do mean squeeze. Even with not much more articulation than what we've seen from the 2014 uh, Cherokee, sporting three-wheel motion frequent, uh, frequently through the test drive video of Moab, as cool as they look, the larger tires apparently rub a bit when the steering uh, is angled at full tilt. It happens to the best of us, guys. The, uh, the hood has been robbed from the SRT model of the same year and not only looks mean as hell, but it boasts lightweight bragging rights being made from aluminum, not steel. We've recently heard about the Jeeps experimenting with lightweight materials as, their manufacturing, uh, as part of their manufacturing process. <clears throat> So it looks like this might be an example of that. Although it's just a concept vehicle at this point, let me underline concept vehicle. I know some of us were getting really excited. Uh, there will probably be some more of these features that make their way to the next generation of the trail hop packages on the 2015 Grand Cherokee. The use of light, uh, lighter wheels, lighter body panels, and the aluminum hood, and maybe even some of the lifted components. The cut wheel wells, however, are not likely going to make it to the production line, so that means it's likely 32s, 33s, and not 35s. Hmm, I wonder if Jeep could go to it. We could do it, couldn't we? <laughs> well, I'm not a Grand Cherokee owner, nor do I intend, intend to be in, in the near future. So if you do a Google search on for Jeep right now, the second most popular result <laughs> is the amazing parking, <laughs> parking job by a certain XJ owner. It's been uh, saturating the interwebs all week. A picture from behind a newer model white Corvette parked diagonally across two parking spots in front of a restaurant. 
Nothing irritates most of us more than seeing some jackass demonstrate his belief and his uh, that his automobile is so vastly superior to the rest of us that he must take up, at the very least, and no less than twice the required area for a properly parked car. This display of douchebaggery <laughs> caught the eye of Kyle DiMata from New Jersey, who then pulled his lifted, mud-covered 95 Jeep Cherokee right alongside this vet, and I do mean close, parking half on the sidewalk in front of the Red Robin where, he, uh, where this all took place. His reasoning? Nothing more than an attempt to, uh, to prove a point. Kyle's, whose Twitter name is uh, at Lifted95XJ, did the right thing. He showed this numbskull, you don't need a $75,000 vehicle to park like you're special. (laughs) We mean special in a good way. Kyle parked his Jeep even closer to the front door with two tires uh, up on the walkway and not much more than a body uh, width away from the side of the vet. Then he went inside and got a window seat. When he then got the uh, uh, where I'm sorry, where he then got the video of the vet owner returning to his car, then spending the next several minutes examining every inch of the uh, driver's side of it, <laughs> looking for what he knew was going to be door dings galore. <laughs> Passers, uh, passerbys pointed, uh, laughed as they walked by, sharing the public humili- humiliation that Kyle had dished out to this vote uh, vet owner, uh, but the owner found not near a scratch. Although the temptation to do a wheel stand on the back of the Corvette was presented uh, the entire time, Kyle showed his uh, fair amount of restraint by leaving enough room for the vet owner to still get in the car. Me personally, I wouldn't have left enough room for a flea to fart between me and the car to ensure that only one way to get in this douchebag mobile would be from the passenger side. Yeah, I don't know how you guys feel about this stuff. Um, I'll uh, I'll do a little side note here. We have a uh, xjtalk.com member that uh, recently uh, was uh, driving his uh, us recently a couple of years ago, driving his uh, uh, um, what do you call it the bedliner covered uh, Cherokee, and uh, somebody zoomed into a parking lot space that he was getting ready to pull into, and uh, the I think it was a BMW or something. Uh, we all we all hate BMW owners, don't we? So uh, we'll say PMW. So the guy gets out and uh, Greg says, hey, that's my spot. You took it. Uh, Too bad. Get the next one. And he says, I'd move it if I was you. And the guy proceeds on. I think he was walking into Academy. He goes to proceed on in to uh, (laughs) do what he needs to do with the thing. And uh, Greg uh, unleashes the uh, the brake on the uh, the winch that was on the front of his Cherokee and starts spooling out the line. The guy stops, turns around, and says, "Hey, what are you doing?" He goes, "Hey, you're not going to move it. I'll move it." Well, needless to say, the BMW owner got in this vehicle, backed out, and found another parking spot. Now, I know, guys, we're talking about police involvement here for some of these things, but. Uh, we're going to put up with this kind of crap. I mean, there, there are people doing things because they know nobody's going to stand up for what's right, uh, over and over and over again. And, uh, I think at times you have to pick your battles, but I think at times it's a, a good idea to, uh, stand up to these individuals and let them know that not everybody is a sheep. Some people are wolves. So, uh, Hey, if you'd like to submit a story to be aired in this week, of Jeep, or if you have a response to any one of our stories, please send an email to newstips at xjtalkshow.com. That's newstips at xjtalkshow.com. xjtalk.com is where you go when you're not off-road. And now you can go to xjtalk.com when you're off-road too. Using your smartphone, install the Tap a Talk app, then search for xjtalk. Take XJ Talk with you wherever you go. Jury duty, dinner with your spouse's parents, even, well, anywhere you need your XJ Talk fix. Hey guys, this is Andy from IronMan4x45.com, also known as Iron Man Andy, and you're listening to the XJ Talk Show. This is Dan from the 4x4 Podcast, and you're listening to the XJ Talk Show. Hey, today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Over 150,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Get a free audiobook download 
and a three a 30 day not a three day but a 30 day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash xj talk show and you'll be helping the show out a little bit with a little something something so uh, keep that in mind hey um next week you've heard it before and uh, i think it's uh, getting to be one of our most popular little uh, uh, little segments it's a little short little thing uh we have a, a new person on the show called richard cranium allswell the third and i'm not sure if all's well with richard but anyway uh <laughs> so watch it watch the show listen to the show next week for the autobi- autobiography of jeep cherokee xj again returns next week Hey, now it's time to give a little love to our YouTube subscribers, and uh, we do love them. We got like 612 subscribers and over 184,000 views, and man, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. Uh, it's uh, it's so nice to to be loved, and you know, I guess I I know how uh, Sally felt when she says, uh, "You love me, you really love me." Hey, uh, number one on our list is Jay Gardner, 198. Number two, Jeep 96 4 x 4 uh, number three is Tony Axtell. Uh-huh, I know I've asked you a question. And there's uh, the, we'll round out the list with number four, Adam Downey. Hey, we really appreciate you guys uh, joining us. And uh, we always try to follow back. If we don't uh, follow you back right away, uh, or I think it's subscribe back. If uh, we don't subscribe back right away, keep watching because we will subscribe back to you. We really appreciate it. So now we're going to get to our voicemail, and uh, of course, we've got something from Nikki G. Hey, this is Tony. And this is Josh from the XJ Talk Show. We want to thank you for calling our 24-7 voice line. Yes, we do. Just leave your first name and your question or comment. There's no guarantee, but we may play your message on the podcast. Oh, and don't worry about keeping it clean. We'll take care of that. Now it's your turn to speak at the beep. Hey, this is Nikki G, and I just caught the show, and uh, the audio problems that Josh was experiencing is uh, not a hardware issue or because of Skype or anything. It's because he's further north and uh, closer to the ozone layer and uh, the hole in the ozone layer and uh, closer to the sun. So uh, that's what all that distortion is coming from. And uh, what you guys did... uh, Amazon, you bought what this week? You didn't mention the purchase that I made. Uh, I bought a mirror to go over my bed. And it uh, took a while to find one that says uh, objects in mirror may be larger than they appear. But uh, Amazon had it, believe it or not, and got a good deal on it. And I just brought your show down a notch. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> All right, guys, I'll uh, chat to you later. Have a good one. Bye. Well, Nikki G, uh, we've had uh, comments from uh, people. Uh, I know personally, I've had people uh, the chatting with me on Facebook saying that Nikki G really cracks me up. So uh, I don't think you uh, bring the bring the show down a notch. But uh, so uh, no, don't worry about that. Keep those calls coming in, and, uh, and you guys should call in and uh, let Nikki G know uh, how great a job he's doing on uh, calling in every week. And I don't know if you guys are aware of it or not, but uh, Josh and I do another show called the Tony and Josh show that we also have this same live format, except it's on Wednesday nights, 10 PM, youtube.com slash, uh, Tony and Josh show. And, uh, Nikki G also calls into that show. So he's doing double duty. I can't help but think if we, if Josh and I were doing 10 podcasts, uh, Nikki G would be calling it each one of them. I just wish Nikki G had different hours so we could get him on the show. But anyway, thanks a lot for those, uh, all those voice, uh, mail calls. And uh, again, you guys can call in, just call 530-675-4102, 530-675-4102. And it's a 24 by 7 uh, voicemail line. Nobody will answer the phone. You don't have to worry about if you call in at 3 o'clock in the morning. Call at 3 o'clock in the morning. Not an issue. Leave your message. Uh, Don't even mind having some uh, expletives. That's curse words for you folks down in the South, because I'm in the South. I can say that. And because uh, we'll take care of that, we'll bleep them for the show. And, uh, you know, it sounds kind of funny uh, whenever you hear somebody talking and there's a bleep, you know, something bad happened. And we all kind of giggle like it's uh, like somebody farted in an elevator. Well, I guess you don't giggle when you fart in an elevator. You just try to stand real still like and look at somebody else like they did it. Maybe this is me. <laughs> so 
Anywho, uh, let's uh, let's roll over to. Uh, oh, I never should say roll over on a Jeep show. Let's get, move over to uh, a, a new Jeep Garage. Uh, actually, this will be Jeep Garage episode four, and uh, this will be part of our Jeep tips uh, that uh, Steve four point three LXJ. Uh, lovingly puts together for us and makes available. We'll actually be doing a couple of uh, uh, tips tonight. Uh, one will be this first one, which is a Jeep Garage 4, and then a new uh, a new one called Jeep Archives 1, both by Steve 4.3 LXJ. And now for a disclaimer. Jeep Tips is for entertainment purposes only. If you choose to follow these tips, man up and take the responsibility for your own actions. If you cannot or you feel that working on your Jeep is beyond your abilities, seek the help or advice of a trained certified mechanic. Got a tip? We do. It's time for Jeep Tips. Last time on Jeep Garage, we talked about welding two pieces of metal together. And remember, we're going to be using both hands. We're going to make sure we maintain a puddle that's white hot and... Uh, where the metal is flowing and then we're going to fill that little gap in that we have with some extra molten metal and that constitutes a weld. Now that's different than just sticking some metal on there. That means you actually have one continuous piece of metal when you're done. Well last time I also uh, promised you that uh, I would talk about vertical and horizontal welding and uh, next time I'm going to talk about making some repairs to floor, pan, floor pans and other body parts. And before we do that, we have to learn one essential important skill that you need to master before you can do these things. Uh, and that includes uh, welding up cracks in your frame and uh, welding uh, suspension parts on, all of these kinds of things depend on a skill that's called stitching. Now, if you've ever sewn with a needle and thread, I know I have, uh, you can sew in a linear fashion where you just sort of go in a straight line, or you can sew with a stitch where you uh, go ahead and then you come back on yourself and you go ahead a little more and you come back. And that's the kind of stitching that we're going to do with a welder. And the reason we have to do this is that a MIG welder is not made to weld vertically or horizontally. Um, it just doesn't work. There are uh, uh, fluxes and so forth on a stick welder that help you do this. But a MIG welder, if you're running a gas shield, does not have this. And if you're trying to weld sheet metal with flux core, you're not going to have a very good time of it either. So. What we really need to have is a MIG welder with a gas shield that uh, we can stitch with. And one of the essential things that I urged everyone to get was the auto darkening helmet. And this is something that makes stitching so, so much easier. So the way it works is like this. When we go to weld vertically, we could weld from the top down, but this is a very weak weld. It doesn't penetrate and uh, puts a lot of metal on the floor usually. And uh, it's just really not a strong weld. So to, to weld vertically, we need to start at the bottom and go up. But if we do this with a MIG welder, you just hold the trigger down on the gun. You're going to really start putting a lot of metal on the floor. It's going to look ugly and it uh, probably will burn through and... By the time you get some of that metal rolling around on the floor and it gets into your shoe or it gets on your pant leg or anything else, you're not going to like this. So stitching will allow you to be able to do all these things and it'll be much more comfortable and the outcome will be what you want. So to stitch, what we're going to do is make a series of what amounts to a tack weld. So we are going to tack weld our piece in place if we're going to weld something on. And then we're going to make a small weld. Oh, probably uh, be about 3 sixteenths of an inch long. And then we're going to take our finger off of the trigger. Our helmet, our auto darkening helmet now, is going to immediately allow you to see 
you will move the wire up about another three sixteenths of an inch and then you will hit the trigger again and weld back down to where you started. Now you're going to take your finger off of the trigger again. You're going to move up another three sixteenths of an inch and then you're going to hit the trigger again and weld back down. This is uh, not a fast way to weld, but it's really the only way to weld with the average MIG welder. Now when we do these settings on this, um, we have to set the welder for a setting that's a little higher than what the metal would call for if we were going to do a flat weld. So let's say we're going to uh, weld on the sheet metal of our frames, our unibody jeeps, what passes for a frame and so forth. We're going to set our MIG welder at about an eighth of an inch for the uh, amount of electricity that we're going to put into it. And then we're going to take our wire feed and it'll have a suggested wire speed for you. And we're going to turn that up just a little bit, not a lot, but uh, say if, if you were going to have it on a setting of three, you want to do about three and a quarter. And what that does is it's going to help us put down enough material quickly so that uh, we can come back on the weld, yet it's not going to be so quick that it doesn't weld properly. And what we want to do is let that new wire absorb some of the heat so that it'll keep our metal that we're putting on from dripping. And uh, if it's dripped off, you haven't done a thing. All you've done is put more heat into the area than what you wanted to put in. So we're going to go up 3 sixteenths, back, up 3 sixteenths, back, up 3 sixteenths, back. And if you, once you get good at this and you can do it quickly, what you want to do is to never let the uh, cherry red color go out of what you just welded. And if you get to where you're nice and fast at it, uh, you can uh, make a very nice weld. Now, the reason for that red color is that if you maintain that, not the white hot, but the cherry red, it's very easy for the metal to go from that cherry red condition to white and make a nice fuse. So when we go and do a horizontal stitch weld, we do the same technique. 3 sixteenths up, 3 sixteenths back, 3 sixteenths up, 3 sixteenths back. And once you manage to get this skill down, then you're ready to start welding on your Jeep and you can start making the repairs that you want to make. But if you haven't mastered this skill, don't do it because the metal on our Jeeps is fairly thin and it doesn't respond well to welders. You can get uh, smaller wire, you can go down to O2O wire and, and stuff like that, but it's still really hard to just run a continuous bead on metal that's as thin as what our body panels and stuff are. So you want to keep the heat down and the way to do that is by stitching. And this allows the, uh, the weld to go on and be a good weld but it also doesn't uh, create a situation where we're putting too much heat into what we're welding and have the sheet metal warp on us. So when we're going to do things like putting in floor plan pans and uh, stuff like that, or uh, welding up uh, some tube fenders and uh, welding them into our body and so forth, um, this will allow us to do it without warping the metal that we're welding on and it'll give a nice result. So get this down, get it right, and then you'll be ready to start welding on your Jeep. You know, I call, kind of call these uh, these welding, welding segments that uh, Steve's been doing for us uh, welding porn because uh, you uh, you hear it and it's like uh, uh, <laughs> it's like health class where they, they're teaching you about you know the sex ed stuff. You want to go out there and uh, go out there and try it out a little bit uh yeah i'm off to touch base with steve and uh, i think he may have gone over it in the uh, the earlier uh episode of jeep garage but i think he named a specific welder to get and i'd really like to get one uh, and as i mentioned on an earlier show 
the one I was looking at getting is a thousand dollars, and that doesn't include any of the the helmet, the gloves, the jacket, uh, the uh, little cart to roll it around on and uh, hold the gas bottle uh, or the bottle or the gas. So uh, I, I understand it. if it's a MIG welder, you're still going to have to have the uh, the bottle and the gas. And to, my understanding is to, to do it properly, you need to do it uh, that way and not use a flux core i think is what uh what you you can do to get around the shielding gas if i'm uh, learning correctly from uh, steve if i'm remembering correctly and uh but uh, boy if i could get a if i could get a nice wig uh wig wig welder that would be a good way to get that wig uh, attached to your head wouldn't it get a nice mig welder for something well under a thousand bucks um it would be a lot <laughs> i'd be getting a welder a lot sooner and uh learning how to stick two pieces of metal together I really like the idea of uh, being able to work on my Jeep and the ability to uh, fix things that are, are broken or maybe make things uh, to uh, well to, to to break it easier uh, out on the uh, off road. That would be uh, to me that'd be kind of fun and uh, it give me more of ability to do everything on my Jeep and not just uh, uh, have to rely on the uh, the kindness of strangers. So anyway, uh, by the way, if you guys missed the opening of the show, Josh isn't here tonight because uh, there was a family emergency. His uh, father-in-law was uh, involved in a motorcycle wreck and uh, motorcycle accident, and uh, Josh is uh, at the hospital with uh, his uh, significant other and uh, there in uh, the hopes that uh, everything's going to be okay for the father-in-law. Please uh, remember him in your prayers as well as uh, Josh and uh, his significant other. And here's a picture of Josh that we dug out. Isn't that pretty? That's actually the background on the screen where I'm grabbing um, Josh's image from Skype. If if Josh was on, he, his his video would be right there on the screen. And this happens to be the background of uh, uh, of what the screen is there. I thought it was kind of funny. Uh, kind of looks like Josh laying down, I guess. Or multiple Joshes. Anyway, I digress. So let's get to our next uh, Jeep tip. This one is a, a new one that Steve did called uh, Jeep Archives. And I, I think he's going to touch base on some of the stuff that uh, he's learned over the years and the many, many Jeeps that uh, he's uh, dealt with over the, the long span of his life. I'm making him feel really bad now. <laughs> Tonight we're going to start a, uh, a new series called Jeep Archives. And... Uh, Unfortunately, I have been around long enough that I have driven most of the different kinds of Jeeps there are. If I haven't owned them, at least I've ridden in them. So uh, I'd like to uh, start tonight by uh, talking about the first Jeep. And that was the, uh, the MB, if you happen to have a Willys, or if it was a Ford, it was a GPW. Now, I've had a couple of Fords. And uh, when I talk to my buddies down at the National Recon Group and tell them, yeah, I had two of these things, they look at me dumbfounded because it cost them a lot of money just to get one. (laughs) They're very collectible now. And uh, they started out uh, off of the Bantam prototype, and the government kind of put the shaft to them once the Bantam produced its prototype, and and, uh, they turned it over to Willys. Willys could not make enough of them, so they gave the contract to Ford, and Ford then started making the uh, GPW. And it didn't matter whether you had an MB or a GPW, the military designation for these uh, uh, vehicles was the general purpose vehicle. And so uh, GIs, instead of saying, go get me a general purpose vehicle, they kind of shortened it up to a GPV, and then it just got shortened up even more to the GP, and then it just turned into Jeep. And that's how the name was born. Now, the first uh, MBs didn't even have a uh, stamped grill like we all know and love. They had a uh, a grill that that anybody could make. It was made out of flat iron. Had uh, a six-volt battery in it, which was common for the day. Everything was six-fold back in the 40s and 30s and so forth. Um, They didn't go to 12-volt until they started uh, getting a little fancier cars in the 50s. So, had small six-volt headlights, had some blackout lights, uh, and uh, 
had a big old six volt generator on it that put all put out all of about 30 amps and uh, there wasn't much on these things they uh, you know outside of the lights and uh, the starter there wasn't anything electrical on them windshield wipers were by Armstrong they had a little handle on the inside and you uh, wiggled that handle back and forth while you were driving and uh, if you had to shift gears well then you stopped your windshield wiper up operation and you uh, shifted gears and then you went back to your windshield wiper and uh, a lot of these jeeps had uh, a top of sorts it was just kind of a surrey uh, that kind of went down and back um, and uh, uh, couldn't drive too fast in the rain because uh, the rain would start coming around the backside and it would get on the uh, inside of the windshield and you didn't have a windshield wiper for that it only worked on the outside so uh, the, most of the jeeps however that were made for uh, world war ii uh, didn't have any top and i can tell you from experience uh, the ones that i had uh, 32 miles an hour is the magic speed to drive in the rain you can work your windshield wiper and the rain will go over the top of you. If you drive any faster, like 33 miles an hour, the back of your head gets wet. At 35, the inside of the windshield gets wet. So you uh, drive 32 miles an hour in the rain without a top. Anyway, uh, uh, the uh, running gear was rather light in them. They had a T84 transmission, and uh, I'm not sure there ever even was a spicer number designated on the transfer case uh, those transfer cases kind of looked like a spicer 18 except that uh, they had their own gear tooth count and and so forth and a lot of the parts didn't bolt and, or anything like that and uh, they had dana 25 axles front and rear and the reason they did that was that the military wanted to be able to drop these things out of the air if they wanted to so they specified that they had to weigh less than 2,000 pounds. Well, they didn't make it. Uh, the final weight was about 2,700 pounds, and uh, so they never hit that. So uh, eventually the military then decided they still wanted to hit that 2,000 pound mark, and they uh, designed the M422 Mighty Might, that weighed 1,750 pounds, but was never built until 1961. But that's another story. I have one of those too. Uh, but uh, the MB, or GPW, uh, was identical. The only thing that was different about them was the front cross member. The uh, Willys version had a tubular cross member, and the uh, Ford version had the uh, stamped steel rectangular cross member on the front. Other than that, can't tell the difference. The rear axle, even though it was a Dana 25, had uh, one good thing going for it, and that was that it had spindles on it. So it was a full floater axle, and uh, the spindles were the same size, the hubs were the same size that were on the front, and really it was quite strong. It would carry a lot of weight, but the Dana 25 was not a strong axle, and I can tell you also from experience it's easy to take the spiders out of them, and uh, in fact I did. So uh, uh, they uh, later upgraded those axles. But for all intents and purposes, for off-road uh, use with no lockers or anything like that, the uh, Dana 25 front and rear did work. Uh, gear ratios were 488, and uh, the GIs loved them. They had a 15-gallon uh, a under-the-seat gas tank, and... Uh, you might be a little squeamish about the idea of uh, sitting on a tank of gas, but uh, until the uh, uh, 1960s, uh, that's the way it was. <laughs> Everybody sat on a tank of gas if you drove a Jeep. So uh, that's the way it was. And to uh, fill it, you uh, got out of the Jeep, you removed the seat cushion and uh, take a huge cap off that was big enough that you could... Uh, pour gasoline out of a gas can uh, without a spout and hit the hole and uh, uh, away you would go. Mileage wasn't all that great. Got about eight, ten miles to a gallon. Didn't go too fast. 
you know, 60 miles an hour was it downhill, uh, about 55 on flat ground. And uh, the one that I had, uh, uh, it would uh, go uphill faster than two things on the road. The uh, old Volkswagen, 35 horsepower Volkswagens and Greyhound buses. Everything else passed it uphill. So, uh, in fact, I even got passed by the school bus every day as I drove home from school. But uh, anyway, they uh, that was the uh, the first Jeeps and what started the Jeep tradition. And uh, next time on uh, Jeep Archives, we'll talk about the, the CJ2A and uh, the civilian market. Wow, what a uh, a long and illustrious life uh, Steve has had, especially seeing how he started off with Jeeps. I mean, he was going to school when he, and driving uh, one of the original Jeeps. That's uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I really appreciate that because uh, I really came into the Jeep game pretty late. Uh, I think uh, around, I guess it was around uh, uh, the mid 80s, uh, or well, I guess maybe early 80s when I uh, I got real interested in having a Jeep. And uh, I looked, uh, I checked with my insurance company and the, the price of insurance to have a, a Jeep Wrangler uh, back then was sky high for me because I, I was, uh, I don't think I was uh, 19, 20 years old at the time. So that quickly uh, <laughs> uh, screwed my idea of having a Jeep. So that, uh, that wish to have a Jeep didn't resurface again until uh, 98, at least uh, the realization of having one. So uh, I like uh, going back and hearing what the original Jeeps were and uh, how they came into being. I mean, I knew they were a military vehicle used in, in World War II, and uh, they were a general all-purpose Jeep. It's, but it's really interesting hearing how everything was, uh, was mechanical. I mean, where you, you basically had to work it with your hands, uh, short of uh, you know, putting uh, your feet through the floorboard and, and running like uh, Fred Flintstone, that is. Of course, you had the, uh, the engine to move it along, but... Manually operated wipers, and uh, that's just really cool. I need to find one of these old uh, Jeeps. I've seen them before, but I haven't had this information uh, that uh, Steve just uh, gave us. I'd like to actually look and see how that uh, how that worked. I mean, I'm sure it's a very simple uh, knob and uh, through the uh, the windshield frame into the uh, the wiper and let it let you move it back and forth. But I still like to see it with this new knowledge. It it often helps to uh, better understand. Hey, Josh. Josh? Oh, I guess Josh isn't here. <laughs> so uh, this is the segment we like to call uh, Chit Chat, and uh, I guess it'll just be Chit tonight uh, because uh, <laughs> Josh isn't here. So uh, i uh I'll tell you something uh, kind of quick. Uh, I was really happy that uh, Matt, uh, Matt Smorenberg from uh, xjtalk.com uh, he had to run out and pick up some parts that uh, I uh, I picked up for him here locally uh, from a Craigslist um, uh, advertiser. He's putting together uh, an MG. I know it's not a Jeep, but you know Matt's that way. <laughs> and anyway, I had been after him to uh, to let me come up there and uh, get a couple of uh, Jeep seats, uh, front seats uh, that were from uh, same year and also uh, same color uh, covers as uh, my '98. Uh, Cherokee and uh, since he was coming out to pick up the MG parts that I'd picked up for him uh, he went ahead and brought the seats down to me now this isn't one of these is the seat the other one is not now I apologize for you folks that are listening to the audio audio only podcast but look at it this way it's just a Jeep seat you're looking at uh, if you were here looking at it so uh, I had no idea that I was getting this uh, seat so dirty uh, the one on the left is the one that I've had in my Jeep from from the day that I purchased it with 19 miles on it from uh, the uh, the local dealership. And uh, yes, kiddies, uh, if you work on your Jeep and then uh, don't think you're that dirty and go to sit down in it to move it, uh, back it out of the garage so you can pick up the tools and everything else, your Jeep seat will get dirty like this. Now, the, the Jeep seat on the right is the one that Matt brought me. Unfortunately, the frame uh, was uh, was pretty much toast on that thing. So what I did, oh, and if you can see there on the left, you can see where the uh, 
the vinyl had uh, torn and you can see some of the the cushion uh, sticking out from the side. That's the thing that I was, uh, at least in my mind, was the big thing that was bothering me about it was not that it was that filthy, but uh, that it was uh, torn and uh, exposed. Also, too, I didn't realize that the, the cushion was pushed in so much, but hey, that's what happens when you get a fat ass, right? So anyway, I... Uh, uh, I learned I learned me how to uh, recover my uh, my seat since the the one Matt brought had a broken frame. I needed to use my frame, and I've got power seats anyway, so it would probably work out just uh, better mo- moving the uh, the covers. So getting the the cushion off that the the one that you sit on it worked out really easy. That one wasn't very difficult to get out of there at all, and uh, I went ahead and moved the cover and the cushion to my uh, uh, original frame and then I had to actually pull the cover uh, and the of course the uh, the headrest the headrest is easy it just pulls straight out but I had to pull the cover off the new seat pull the cover off on my old seat and replace uh, it and it probably took me you know first time doing it it may have taken me an hour to do it and uh, I'll have to apologize for the aspect ratio of this picture but uh, certainly you can tell Uh, how nice that seat looks in there now don't get me wrong folks i would much rather have a nice off-road suspension racing zoom 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 uh red and black with uh, xj talk logo uh you know one of those 500 hundred dollar jobs love having a couple of those in there uh but my god that's a lot of money to spend for a seat and this is this is really my daily driver and as as cool as it would be to have custom uh seats in there i think that this is uh, probably a lot more practical for me so anyway, now what I have is a nice seat. It looks very nice, very new. I cleaned it up with some carpet cleaner, a poster carpet cleaner. Got it sitting in there, uh, and <laughs> now the, the steering wheel looks like crap. <laughs> so I've been researching what I can do about that steering wheel. Um, one of our uh, XJTalk.com members uh, posted up the other day about uh, getting some help with uh, uh, covering the um covering the uh, steering wheel with uh, paracord and uh, I, uh, I remember reading that so I uh, I've been digging around a little bit and uh, seeing how you can uh, do that and if that might be a, a good alternative I know that stuff is very resilient and uh, and hell even, even if it's not if you know how to put it on there once you can always take it off and and put some on there again and uh, they come in different colors of course you could do different patterns one of the things I read, though, was is that if you don't uh, gut it, in other words, take the, the strands that are inside, I guess there's some sort of rubbery strand, st- strands that give it the strength. And if you don't gut it and take that out, it has a tendency to be really, really thick. So you wind up with a much bigger steering wheel and may not be comfortable for your hands. I guess that really depends on the size of your hands. So uh, I've kind of been looking around, seeing if I can uh, figure out a good color uh, to go on there. So you might may see a future video on YouTube where I, uh, I, I at least go through how I covered my steering wheel and paracord. Um, I sure wish there was a, a, a way to replace the factory leather that was on there with uh, a replacement that you know was exactly that same uh, fit. And uh, I understand it might take some uh, some skill learning how to stitch that thing up and getting it tight, but uh, I, I really like the original uh, leather on the steering wheel. I thought that looked nice. Although uh, the paracord probably would be uh, have you give you a little bit more grip and a little more control uh, for on and off road, uh, which which would be nice. Um, you get some uh, some cleaner there on that leather, and it uh, does have a tendency to get slick. And if you're you're uh, wearing your extra cool racing driving gloves it might actually slip no i'm just kidding i don't have driving gloves although it has gotten cold enough where i have driven it with with uh, gloves even uh, down in the houston area so uh, uh that probably happens to you guys uh, more uh, frequently in the uh, northeast uh, north and northwest so I, think, I still think it'd be cool to to drive around in snow well, let's see what else. Uh, oh, uh, I had uh, I had reported back uh, that I was getting a ticking noise. Uh, sounds less like this. I don't like it when the engine makes a ticking noise. It bothers me. So uh, I was pretty happy today. Whenever I came outside, started up the uh, the Jeep to go home, and there was no ticking noise. Now, I, I, of course, I've noticed it being getting less and less, and uh, the temperatures have gone down here. 
Uh, we're, we're no longer in uh, the seven inches from the sun category where we're more of like a two feet from the sun. So actually, I don't think it was uh, above like uh, 85 today. So uh, it, it appears that uh, maybe uh, the lifter has a little more problem whenever it's hotter inside that engine bay. So we'll see as time goes on if that lifter noise uh, abates completely. And uh, of course, if it comes back next summer. Uh, but engine seems to be running fine. Uh, I, uh, I always measure my uh, gas mileage. Uh, I think it is a good way to see how well your engine is running or maybe how, uh, how much foot, uh, how much ankle exercise you're getting on that skinny pedal. Uh, but uh, I think uh, my, uh, my last uh, fill up, I was at 11.29, which is uh, pretty good. Yes, yes, that's 11 miles per gallon, folks, <laughs> which is pretty good considering uh, during the uh, peak heating of uh, August, I was uh, seeing uh, 10.5s, 10.8s. Um, yeah, that'd be good for an ETA, wouldn't it? Um, but anyway, uh, so I don't know if that has to do with the the temperatures going down, if it has to do with uh, the lifter pumping up a little bit, or maybe it's all of the above. But at any rate, that's what's going on with my Jeep, and uh, I'm really happy with uh, the seat now that I've got it covered and that I've got that cushion replaced. And you know... It's more comfortable. I had to lower the seat a little bit because I felt like I was sitting too high. <laughs> well, that's our show. We're uh, finishing up a little early, but that's understandable because uh, Josh wasn't here to help fill the uh, the time with entertainment and uh, words of wisdom. But, uh, you know, that's how it goes. Uh, again, uh, let's all remember uh, Josh's uh, father-in-law and our prayers uh, he was in a motorcycle accident. That's why Josh isn't here tonight. And uh, uh, I'm sure Josh will be giving us an update uh, in the future. Hopefully it will be uh, very good news, if not uh, uh, maybe uh, miraculous, miraculous news. So uh, don't forget those prayers. I know I'm going to say mine right after the show. And uh, uh, even if you don't believe in prayers, give it a try just because uh, it's worth a shot. What can it hurt, right? Nobody's going to know if you uh, said a prayer. Anywho, so look, don't forget uh, to uh, follow us on Facebook, uh, XJ Talk. We're on Twitter, also XJ Talk, uh, although the name says XJ Talk Show, but if you do at XJ Talk, you can find us. Uh, we are, uh, of course, here for the, the to promote the forum, the Jeep uh, forum that you can go and uh, ask questions, uh, smart ones, dumb ones, uh, all in between. And you're not going to get flamed, at least not more than once, because uh, we don't allow that. Uh, and honestly, uh, we never have to say anything to anybody on, on very rare occasions. Uh, the, the website, xjtalk.com, has been around now for over five years. March was our fifth anniversary, and uh, we got a lot of tech, a lot of people there, and they're all friendly and helpful. Uh, so if you ask a question that's been asked 10,000 billion million quadrillion times before, nobody's going to say that. They're going to answer your question. They're not going to say Google is your friend. They're going to answer your question. And, you know, if they don't like it, if they don't like hearing the question for the 10 billionth time, they're not going to let you know that it upset them. And this is the way forums should work. <laughs> we all need to learn. And sometimes we forget and we need to be reminded. So that's what xjtalk.com is there for. We urge you to come over there and be a member and ask the questions that you wouldn't dare ask on some of the other sites because of all the crap that you see that people have to go through when they ask a question about, uh, hey, can I put a body lift on my 95XJ? It's a unibody, so you can't separate it. That's fine. Anyway, so until next week, and hopefully Josh will be here, have a great Jeep week.